So, um, you've heard lectures uh, up till this point now about message passing and about what MPI is and how you find out sizes and ranks and how you send messages between two individual processes and how you send collective messages. And in a lot of ways, that's, that's it. That's all you need for MPI, writing an MPI program, okay? Um, in fact, all you really need is the point-to-point -point stuff. You don't even need the collectives. You can write all the collectives yourself if you want to. But clearly, there's a, there's a fair bit more to MPI than that because this big book, Collectives and point to point are just two chapters out of uh, whatever there is in here, 17 chapters or something. So this next this lecture and the next one after it, we talk a little bit about some of the other things which are in the MPI library, which are not essential for you to use for your parallel programs, but may be useful, may help you, may save you time in writing the programs and understanding the programs, uh, and may make them more efficient when they're running. And the first one we're going to talk about is virtual virtual topologies. Okay, so all a virtual topology is, is a way of renaming and possibly reordering your MPI processes to match what your data decomposition looks like. You have a program, you split up your data or work across the processes in some specific way. You must know how you've done that because you've written a program to do it. <coughs> but when you, just, when you start MPI by default, all it has is a bunch of processes numbered 0 to n minus 1. And, and conceptually, it just has one single long list of them. It, it, and as far as the MPI library is concerned, processor 0 is just as likely to talk to processor 50 as it is to processor 1. Okay, so conceptually, we may think that processor 1 and 0 are close to each other and it's likely processor 0 sends messages to 1 and vice versa, but the MPI library has no concept of this. It just gives you a bunch of processors that can each send messages to each other um, and as far as it's concerned, that's it. But we know in reality that most people's programs are not like that. We don't have completely unstructured data which is completely randomly generated and processor 0 is as likely to talk to processor 50 as he is to processor 2. In general, most scientific programs have some kind of structure to their data. And actually, for most of them, it's some kind of regular structure, a grid, a, an array, a two-dimensional, three-dimensional, whatever it is, structure. So if we can tell the MPI library about this data structure, how you, how you split up your data and how it's organized, um, it, it, it can give you some things which will enable you to write the code maybe more simply, so it can do some things for you, we'll come on to that. And also it gives it the chance to optimise the communications, make them faster. And it's not guarantee you it's going to change the speed of your communications, but if you have a particular piece of hardware, a machine which has got a, a network which is set up in a particular way, something like a 3D torus, um, then if you tell it your job looks like a certain way, it may be able to map your processes onto that network quite efficiently so that all you're only ever talking to people who are close to you in the network rather than far away, and that might be quicker. Okay? So um, there's been a big set of IBM machines over the past 10 years, a big parallel machines called Blue Jeans, um, a particular kind of, uh, of parallel machine, and they've had a very specific network. Where they, in fact, they have three different networks in them. There's a 5D torus and there's a collective network and an I.O. network. And if you can map your processes onto that network, you can get much better performance than if you just put them anywhere on the network and they have to send messages backwards and forwards. It should be said, though, that virtual topologies in this, the most of the stuff it gives you um, are just things you could do yourself. They're just ways of saying, my rank is zero, and I want to send to my neighbours who are 1, 2 and 3, for instance. How do I work that out? But the MPI library provides you an easy way of doing that, and it also gives the MPI library a way of optimising the communications if that's possible. So this is an example. We're running an MPI programme using 12 processes, so they're ranked 0 to 11. And by default, the MPI program just knows that they're ranked 0 to 11 and doesn't know anything about the communication between them. But we know we're running 
we're going with the data set we're running the way we've split it up is actually a 2d grid and we've split it up into chunks so that rank zero is getting the top left corner of this 2d grid and then rank 11 is getting the bottom right corner of this 2d grid and we also know that our parallel program does nearest neighbor communication so that rank five talks to four and six and nine and one and no one else really for, for the work we're doing so that's what we know we know ourselves about the program because because that's the way we wrote it and actually in this example we can see that we have nearest neighbor communications and we also have what's called periodic boundaries in one dimension and not in the other so ranks zero will send messages to three and rank three will send messages to zero but zero won't send messages to eight and vice versa and it's just a for this particular scientific simulation this is the way you've set it up it's got periodic boundaries on one way but not on the other way there's nothing to say you don't have to have these periodic boundaries you don't have to have them at all so rank zero could it may only talk to one and four and you can have them in both dimensions if you want so rank zero may talk to uh, eight and three and four and one does that make sense of this example reasonably clear now you can see or you should be able to see that um, when we've been doing the message round a ring kind of idea we have we have a, we've had to look at similar concepts for programming so you you have an idea of a ring and you pass to a person on your left and you pass you, know, you pass to a person on your right and you receive from a person on your left and you have to do something at size is zero so rank is zero and rank is n minus one because those equations don't work and so that's that's effectively like one slice of this cylinder here zero passes to one one passes to two two passes to three and three passes round to zero so we could write ourselves the code which calculates who we pass to and you have probably done that already in the passing round the ring example um, but MPI will give you a way of doing this without having to write that code that says if my rank is zero then I have to do something special and if I'm in the middle I can just pass to my right and receive from my left and if I'm at the top I have to do something special again so what kind of topologies does MPI allow you to, to set up? What kind of mapping between your processes and your data does it allow you to do? So there's two main kinds. One's Cartesian. So this is, this is a Cartesian. Basically, you have a specified number of dimensions where you can map the MPI ranks to some kind of coordinate system. And this is a two-dimensional coordinate system here. There is no restriction on the number of dimensions. So you could have a one-dimensional, you can actually have a zero-dimensional Cartesian topology, which actually doesn't do anything, but it's, it's, it's possible, and an n-dimensional topology as well. And the other one is graph topologies. So there's a lot of functionality to do graph topologies, which are useful for sort of unstructured meshes or, or true graph programs. We're not going to talk about the graph stuff here because, in general, it's not really used for most scientific simulations there is there are small subsets where where graph processing is is interesting and but all, quite often we don't actually use mpi at all they'll use some specific graph framework to do this and there are sets of graph frameworks to do processing of graphs but if you are interested in here there's a whole chap half a chapter on how the graph stuff works as well it was works very similar to the cartesian um, what we're going to talk about the Cartesian uh, topologies uh, but it's designed to be uh, sort of uh, graphs of a node and who they're connected to and who they're connected to and passing messages up and down these. Mm. So in a Cartesian topology we've got any, a, a specified number of dimensions each processor is connected to its neighbors in a virtual grid the boundaries may be cyclic or not so just like this example, each processor is regularly connected to its neighbours and we've got cyclic boundaries in one dimension but not in the other. Um, and you can tell the MPI whether you want it to reorder your ranks when it creates this topology. So when you start the programme you have MPI com world and you have a rank in MPI com world. When you create a topology like this you can tell MPI I want you to keep the same rank. So in the new topology, I'm still rank zero, I'm still rank five. Or you can tell it, please change the ranks around to optimize the communications if possible. That's possible. 
And how, so how do you use these topologies? Well, you do it by creating a new communicator. And you use this function called, called MPI cart create. So it takes, as parameters, it takes the old communicator, the number of dimensions of your topology, the sizes of those dimensions, whether the, the periodic boundary conditions, so for each dimension, whether it's periodic or not, whether you want it to reorder the ranks, so that's just a Boolean or an um, um, integer one, zero, 1 in, in C, and then it returns you a new communicator. And that new communicator represents the topology you've, you've asked for. OK. There is a, also a routine which lets you create the dimensions for your topology. So you know you want a three-dimensional topology, and you know how many processes you want in that. It will construct you what it thinks is an optimal arrangement. Now, of course, you may know exactly how many processes you want in each dimension. You can tell it that directly. But if you let your MPI, will try and do something which it thinks is efficient. Yep. So you, can, so you can bias how the dimensions are created. And in that way, you could bias where it goes. Um, you can't tell it how to physically do the reordering. So if you tell it not to reorder the ranks, and then you say, I want x in this dimension and x in that dimension, then you can try and map it to the right place. You will be able to work out which place it will go to. So this. MPI dims create, which creates the number of, number of processes in each dimension for the cart create, um, has a number of ways it can be used. So basically what happens is, if you remember the MPI cart create, you tell it how many dimensions your, your, your topology has, n dims, and then you pass it an array, which has the size of each of those dimensions. And this MPI dim create can create this array for you. So in this example, the first example here, we wanted a two-dimensional topology. And we've told MPI, I don't care the size of either of the dimensions. You just tell me what they, what they should be optimally. And so you, you call MPI dims create. Um, the, the six here is the total number of processes you have, you want in a topology. Two is the dimensions. And dims, it will return you an array saying these are the, the sizes of the two dimensions. And Generally, that would be with six processes and two dimensions, it would be three in one dimension and two in the other. And actually, what it returns depends on the MPI library and the machine you're running on. Um, of course, if, you're trying to, if you've got a number of processes that does not split properly across the number of dimensions you want, then it deals with that by just creating you. Um, in this example here, you've got seven processes, two dimensions. It can't divide seven cleanly by two, so it just says, I'm going to have an array, a long strip of seven processes. It's not going to be a two-dimensional topology. It's only going to be a one-dimensional, because I can't create an optimal two-dimensional. Um, and then you can also specify some of these dimensions. So if you want a three-dimensional topology, but you know uh, in my second dimension, I only want three processes, it to be three processes of ride, you can tell it that. You know, I don't care what my first and third dimension sizes are, but my Second dimension size should be free, and it will do something about that. There are some rules for this. So you can't ask for more processes than your original communicator had in it here. So it can't create you magically new processes when you create a topology. Um, you can't. Um, you can ask for less processes than your original topology. And then what will happen there is that the, the ones that don't, the extra ones, the spare ones that don't fit in here, just get given this, M, they get given a communicator which is null, an MPI com null thing. And so they can participate, but they don't actually do any work in any of these, of these things. And it's also important to remember that if you're using this dims create to set up the dimensions of the, of the topology, when you pass in this dimension array, dims array, you if you don't care 
if you want MPI to work out the size of the dimensions, you need to set the values to zero. Uh, it's quite a common mistake for people to create an array and just pass it in here, uh, assuming that when you create an array in C or Fortran, the values in that side of that array are zero, but they might not be. Okay, so when you write it, when you create an array, it's just two locations in memory or some locations in memory, and they may be zero when they're created, but they may just be set to some random number, and that will cause this thing to fail here. So you need to manually set these dimensions to zero before you pass it into dims create so it, it will do the right thing. And then once you've got a topology, there are a whole set of routines which can help you with that use that topology correctly. So there's one which tells you the rank of a process based on coordinates. So if I if this is called MPI cart rank. Okay, so if I in this example here I called this and I said, my Cartesian coordinate is 1, 1. What's the rank of a process if it sits at 1, 1? It will return to me 5. And so I can say, I know in my program that if I'm sending to 1, 1 in the Cartesian uh, coordinates, that's rank 5. Or 2, 3 is rank 11. And then there's um, the converse, sort of the inverse function, there, which does exactly the same thing if you give it a rank it will tell you what the coordinates in the Cartesian topology of that rank is. So they can be useful if you, if you do have some sort of fixed mapping between the topology and your data and you know I need to go from this point in my topology to this point over here. Actually the more useful routines are these MPI cart shift routines and these let me be able to say I want to send to my neighbour to the left and I want to send to my neighbour to the right. Or who's my neighbour to the left and right? Who's my neighbour up and down in each of the dimensions? So it's a way of when we saw the MPI, the, the sending a message round a ring and we were saying receive from rank minus one, except if I'm zero, then receive from size minus one. And send to rank plus one, except if I'm size, if my, except if my size, my rank is size minus one and then send to zero. It does all that for you. So you just say here, uh, this is my topology. So the communicator here is the new communicator you created with your topology. I want to send to the left or to the right. Okay. Um, so to in in, a, in conventional sense, left and right would be minus one and one, and up and down will be minus one and one for down. I think. Um, yeah. That's where it's correct. And then it will just give you these values back. It will say, if you want to know how to send right and left, then rank source will be the person from the left and rank sync will be the person to my right. And it will just give you these numbers back. Again, you can calculate all this stuff yourself, but this automatically does it for you. And the nice thing about it is that it takes into account whether you've asked for periodic boundaries or not. So in, in, um, this example here, if I use my cart shift and say for rank three here, who's my neighbor to the left and who's my neighbor to the right, it will return me two values. The rank source will be two and the rank sync will be zero. And it automatically knows I'm at the edge of a grid here, but you've got periodic boundaries. So I need to wrap around and send to this person to the left. But if I do the same functionality for rank three, but I want to know the up and down sending, okay, it will say, well, my rank sync is rank seven, and my rank, my rank source for here is something. And it tells you what this something is. It passes you a variable, which is actually defined in the MPI library as something called MPI underscore proc underscore null. And basically what this means is the MPI library knows it means this processor doesn't exist. This process doesn't exist. So don't send or receive anything to this person. It's just an integer, but it means you can pass it into MPI send and MPI receive. The MPI library sees it and it says, okay, this is a call, but it doesn't actually need to do anything because there's no one at the other end. So just ignore this and, and move on to the next. Okay, and that's nice because you can have a single send and receive. 
You don't have to have if statements saying, if my rank is something strange, then don't send. But if it isn't something strange, then do send. You can just have a single send receive. The MPI library works out who your neighbors are. And if, if you don't have a neighbor, it passes you this MPI proc null, but you can just use that as a, as a rank, put it into the routines and they just work. So in some ways, it's almost like if you do Unix Linux program, it's something like dev null, it's, it's a black hole. MPI proc, proc null, when passed to the MPI library, knows this means don't send this message, don't receive this message. So is there any questions about that? Again, it's, it's slightly abstract, I feel, anyway, until you actually do it in practice, but it makes much more sense when we go back to a passing message around the ring and replace your code, which says, who's my neighbors left and right, with a one-dimensional Cartesian topology, which then you can use this shift. Yep. They can do. So the virtual topologies allow you to possibly match the hardware topologies. And if they do, and if you let MPI reorder ranks, it will move them around so that the, so that the nearest neighbor communication is on the fastest hardware, topology, hardware link. There is no guarantee that the MPI library does something sensible, but it can do. And this is letting it do it, if that's been implemented. Now, a lot of hardware, there is no real... Um, it's quite hard to work out what you would do, you know, so it depends on how the network is structured, but that's what it will try and do. You can also create sub-communicators, so smaller communicators from this virtual topology. So you can slice it up into different ways um, using MPI cart sub. So for instance, if I, if I have this, my example again, here. If I just knew that I wanted to do a reduction operation, but I only wanted to do it on each row, okay, I could cut this topology up into three separate, topo three separate communicators with this MPI cart sub, and then I could call whatever it is, reduce on each of those communicators, and then you know, these guys would get together and do some reduction, if it's a sum reduction, but add them all up and put them on zero, and then the next row would add them all up and put them on four, and the next row would add them all up and put them on eight. And then if I wanted to, I could do another sub-communicator on the columns instead. And then you could say, uh, these three, zero, four, and eight could be in a sub-communicator, and they could do a reduce, and they would add up and here. And then suddenly, I've got the global answer just by doing one set of reductions across my rows and then one set of reductions across my columns. And that is something which is quite useful, not for an example like this, which is small, but when you go up to much larger MPI programs, quite often you want to say, everybody doesn't need this data, but only a subset of people who are holding this bit of the array need the data. And then maybe we all need it, but I can just combine from another subset who, who already know. So there's a sort of sub-communicators and um, enable you to restrict, particularly because collective communications can be expensive. And if everyone really doesn't need to be involved, you can, instead of using MPI com world and, and making everybody do a collective, you can set up a particularly small communicator and say, only this row needs to be involved, so we'll just do the work on that. And we, we, we did some work on a plasma code um, with some guys from York and, and Cullum and they reduced their efficiency at, say, 8,000 processes was 2%, and their efficiency now is 80%, purely because they were doing collective communications across all 8,000 processes, but most of them were sending zeros. So you could just construct smaller com communicators and say, actually, the people who are involved in this calculation just send that bit of data, and you massively reduce your the data that's been sent, so the, the parallel performance becomes much larger, much better, should I say. So there are other ways to play with communicators as well. So you don't just need, you don't just have to use Cartesian or, or graph topologies. There are functions in there which we're not going to talk about, which let you say take MPI com world and split it up based on uh, a rank or split it up based on a, a string. So you could say you can get the host name 
for each host you're running on, for each server you're running on, and create a communicator just for that node. So you can create communicators just for each node, and then you can create communicators across all the nodes, but only involving one process on each node and things like that. So there are pure, pure communicator routines which just let you split uh, and join communicators and produce them. But the Cartesian topology is an easy way to do that because it has a physical uh, and a sort of logical mapping between, between ranks and some kind of data decomposition that you have.